on, do you hear? No, it's on. Okay, let's start with prayer. Uh, I promised Paul I'd be, um, shall we say, a little more speedy today. So I've got, a, I've got my uh, goal cut out for me, so we're going to go. We're gonna... Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Sabbath day, and we thank you for the provision to have minds to be able to contemplate you and contemplate what you have done. And we ask that you will be present today as we tackle some very important topics and guide our minds, we ask. Amen. Okay, was something in the fruit? What prompted this is uh, I had a lot of questions and answers after my prior two presentations uh, in January, and um, therefore I felt I couldn't leave something like this out there hanging. Uh, we need to, if it's low hanging fruit, we need to pick it, pun intended. So um, <clears throat> I came back today to present to you my view of uh, whether there. Uh, why there could have been something in the fruit. One other thing, just to remind you, is this, uh, the Science of Sin and Salvation um, 13 lectures that are on the internet. And in lecture one, I make it very clear that all we're going to be dealing with is the Bible and science. We weren't dealing with Ellen White. We didn't deal with Ellen White at all during the entire lecture series on purpose by design. But the questions that I was getting after the other two lectures, especially here, I got some at Kettering, have to do with Ellen White. And so today we are going to be dealing almost exclusively with Ellen White. Yes, we're going to be using the Bible and we're going to be using some science, but she's going to be the lead dog. Uh, Ellen White makes this statement, we have many lessons to learn and many, many to unlearn. God and heaven alone are infallible. Those who think that they will never have to give up a cherished view, never have occasion to change an opinion, will be disappointed. As long as we hold to our own ideas and opinions with determined persistence, we cannot have the unity for which Christ prayed. I'm not telling you today, I'm not using this as a, uh, as a prelim to tell you you've <coughs> got to believe what I'm going to say. I'm going to do it exactly the opposite. What I'm saying today is, you have to decide whether or not what I'm saying fits this category. Maybe it doesn't. And so we need to just keep this in the background. Ellen White makes it very clear that we're going to have to make some changes in what was at least believed in her time. And your, your job is, as Paul says in Romans 14, let everyone be persuaded in your own mind. Well, that's what you're here for today. In the series, uh, The Science of Sin and Salvation, Biblical and Scientific Evidence uh, was presented to linking mobile genetic elements with the following phenomenon. Illness and death. They control the G-coupled protein receptors. And the reason I, s I actually called that out is because controlling the G-coupled protein receptors, for those of you who are in the medical field and know about the G-coupled proteins, you really have, for all intents and purposes, control over that organism if you can control the G-coupled proteins. All of the neurotransmitters, for instance, function on, on G-coupled proteins. And we know thought somehow, some way, is generated with electrical activity, which is a, electrical, a chemical electrical activity in our brain. And even the acetylcholine and all of the other norepinephrine, serotonin, GABA, uh, all of those different um, chemical messengers in the brain all use G-coupled proteins. We went over at length on the, what it's done, uh, apparently done to human reproduction. And it's massive. And uh, that's in lecture three if you'd like to look at it. Reworking brain circuitry. We talked about in lecture three and also in lecture six. So I'm not going to go through those again. I'm just putting these up as a review and complete infestation of our environment. There's no part and there's no place on this planet which isn't absolutely riddled with mobile genetic elements. They've, uh, so I found one paper that even claimed to have found some uh, remnants of viruses in Precambrian uh, when you're looking at the geological column. I'm not, no one el else has uh, come up and reaffirmed that, so I'm not, um, I'm just mentioning that as a possibility. I'm not uh, stating that that's a fact. The relationship of mobile genetic elements with virtually everything in the Bible that the Bible identifies as sin was presented. 
So everything that the Bible puts under the label or under the uh, <coughs> definition of sin, in those 20-some le hours of lecture, I hit, I believe, all of them. And have shown you a clear, um, uh, well, ev scientific evidence, which if, if not um, at the minimum is supportive and I think is highly suggestive. So then how and when did the mobile genetic elements get into the humanity and into our biome? How, do, how is clearly two-thirds of our genome now, which is made up of mobile genetic elements, which wasn't there with the original genome, no one's fighting that. In the clear evidence, uh, why no one can fight that concept or, or challenge that concept is because your body and my body are working constantly to keep them under control and actually remove them. So if, you, if we're, we're all, most of us here, I think, are from a creationist perspective, why would God create something which is cannibalizing itself? He makes a statement, a house divided by, against itself cannot stand. So uh, therefore, this must be a foreign invader. The Bible clearly states that eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil by Adam and Eve as the point in time which e when, when evil entered. And the Lord called to Adam and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded that you should not eat? And he said, well, actually, yes, but it's not my fault. It's the woman. If you hadn't made the woman, I wouldn't be in this problem. And the woman said, well, if you hadn't made the snake, I wouldn't have done it. So that's how that, that, that we have a clear starting point where trouble entered the system. The question then arises, could MG, M mobile genetic elements, have been in the tree of knowledge of, of good and evil's fruit? That's the, the question that we need to ask. The Science and Sel Sel Sin and Salvation series also pre presented clear evidence that mobile genetic elements in food are absorbed intact and fully functional from the human GI tract into the bloodstream and finally into the cells themselves. In rodents, evidence has been shown that ingested protein coding segments of DNA are found in the cells of the recipient intact where they are transcribed and translated into fully functioning proteins. I cover this in lecture five and great length. You can get the papers there. You can get the evidence. This is not questionable. This is clear. It's reproducible. So the fact that something could have been in the fruit, gotten through the GI tract, and into Ellen and White, and Ellen White into Adam and Eve's genome, <laughs> and Ellen White's too, for that matter, and ours, is, uh, is not a debatable subject. They've already shown that that clearly happens, and they have some very interesting um, caveats that they are talking about when they, in the discussion section of these articles. And uh, for us, uh, for those of us who advocate a uh, vegetarian diet, uh, it has a lot to do with uh, the mobile genetic elements that are in the animals we're eating are getting access to our genomes. And that's another topic for another day. Clearly, there is no mechanical reason that thwarted transmission of mobile genetic elements via the fruit into Adam and Eve's genome. Does the Bible indicate whether something was in the fruit? Does the Bible tell us here in this discussion so that we can, you know, Ellen White says she's a lesser light looking to the, pointing to the greater light and anything that she said that's uh, in any way out of sync with the Bible to take the Bible. So, but does the Bible give us an answer here? And the answer, well, I'll read you what it says. And the Lord commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you should not eat of it. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. So he makes it very clear, you've got to eat of it. But he doesn't say why. He says you're going to die. And then he goes on to say, And the Lord said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and also take of the tree of life and eat. Notice eat is another important factor here. And live forever. Therefore, the Lord sent him forth from the garden to till the ground from where he was taken. So he drove out man and placed him at the east of the garden of Eden in a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way, to keep the way of the tree of life. The Bible doesn't tell us. It said they were told not to eat of the fruit. They ate of the fruit and they were escorted out of the garden. 
and they were no, allow, no longer allowed to eat of the tree of life. It doesn't say something was in the fruit or wasn't. So that op option is unanswered as far as the Bible goes. Well, what does Ellen White say? There was nothing poisonous in the fruit of the tree of knowledge itself, nothing that would cause death in partaking it. The tree had been placed in the garden to test their loyalty to God. Hmm. I spent countless hours going over the fact that mobile genetic elements not only cause the first death, but the second death. Reading this statement, one would come to the assumption then that they couldn't have been in the tree of life, just at first blush. You didn't read anything else. Yes, that's what the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, I, I abbreviated it. So that's what she's talking about here, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I should have told, uh, uh, made that clear. It's my mistake. Now, nothing poisonous. Well, mobile genetic elements are made up of nucleotides, DNA and RNA. Those aren't poisonous. They're in our cells all the time. So that clearly would not be what she's talking about. She must have been talking about something else like arsenic or, or uh, something of uh, 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 like lead, which was going to affect their ability to think or something like that. There was nothing like that in the fruit. But what about the death part? That clears to be, appears to be a definite contraindication. Many have tried to prove that there was something pecul some peculiar quality in the tree which called for this prohibition, but this was not the case. The fruit of the tree of knowledge was not in itself injurious. It was used merely as a test of their obedience to God. Will they be obedient to God's requirements or not? We find that Satan came then just as he comes today with temptations upon the point of appetite. This even takes it a step further. I mean, death pretty much gets us into trouble with mobile genetic elements, but injurious definitely does. A compassionate God gave no severe tests, no strong temptation that would tax human endurance beyond the power to resist. The fruit itself was harmless. If God had not forbidden Adam and Eve to partake of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, their action in taking it would not have been sinful. Up to the moment of God's prohibition, Adam might have eaten of the fruit of the tree without realizing any harm. But after God had said, thou shalt not eat, the act became a crime of great magnitude. So when you read this, the first blush, I mean, as you first read it, you think, well, you know, God just said, um, well, remember the, uh, well, a couple of weeks ago, I gave the, the illustration of the two bowls of fruit. Just arbitrarily said, don't eat of that tree. Eat of that tree, you're in trouble. Well, Christ said something before we, let's, let's start with this one and start working. We've now got down to the bottom of this. We've mined down on pretty much on what Ellen White said. There's other statements I haven't included, but I purposely tried to, to pick the ones which would be the most compelling, at least from my point of view. Instead of trying to pick the ones that were the soft ones, I took the ones that I felt had the greatest merit. When Christ said, if I had not come and spoken to them, they had not sinned, but now they have no cloak for their sin, that's just another way of saying that. If God claims that something is, in fact, a fact, and you know it, then you can be held responsible for it. But up until that point, you're not. Now, she makes another interesting statement here. She says, if, and there was many of them, but I, this is the one I was short and I planned to take. If it, it would have been unworthy of man as an intelligent being, it would have sustained Satan's charge of arbitrary rule. She was referring to if, she had prohibit, if God had prohibited Adam and Eve from eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The whole argument that the devil is bringing against God, at least one of the major ones, is that God's arbitrary. The, the definition of arbitrary is you do it because I tell you to. There doesn't have to be a good reason. So when I look at this, if God's not going to be arbitrary in any of this, for him just to say it becomes a sin when I say so, I would have flipped it around and say it becomes a sin because God makes a statement of reality, and when he says it's no longer safe to eat of the fruit, then it's no longer safe to eat of the fruit. That would be a non-arbitrary way of, of going at it. To just have him arbitrarily say, I'm picking this fruit right here, and you can't eat it. Why? Just because I said so. 
what I think put God open to the charge of being arbitrary and would uh, substantiate the devil's uh, um, charges. So the harmless part, however, that's even, that's even more indicative that, that there's no way the mobile genetic elements could have been in there because one thing they do do, they're, you know, they can be harmful without even being injurious. But now let's take what else Ellen White says on the subject. If you were, you know, if you go into a court of law and you bring up, you bring in a witness and you, the witness comes and let's say collaborates with the defense and trying to provide a defense for the, for the um, person who's arrested, then that person becomes open to the prosecution too, to thoroughly cross-examine. So if Ellen White is, we're gonna take her statements uh, that she makes that there apparently was nothing in the fruit whatsoever, it was no different than fr any other fruit in the garden, then we, are, we're op we must take all her statements that she makes about this subject. And we may have, we have, those are now come into play. Christ never planted the seeds of death in the system. Satan planted those, these seeds when he tempted Adam to eat of the tree of knowledge, which meant disobedience to God. Not one noxious plant was placed in the Lord's great garden. But after Adam and Eve sinned, poisonous herbs sprang up. In the parable of the sower, the question was asked the master, didst, thou not, didst not thou sow good f seed in the field? From whence then hath it tares? The, man's, the master answered, an enemy hath done this. All tares are, sold by the, are sown by the evil one. Every noxious herb is of his sowing. And by his ingenious methods of amalgamation, he has corrupted the earth with tares. Now she's made a number of statements with amalgamation. And that would be kind of a sidebar. And I don't want to get caught into it. But I will make the statement that I, can, I believe I can uh, show supporting evidence that when she's using the word amalgamation, she's got to be referring to something in our information system or our genetic or, or what we inherit from our parents. So um, she said, all tares are, are sown by the evil one. This is all in the same paragraph. She's including them all together in this discussion. I didn't take one quote from one part of her books and another quote from another. This is all in the, the same uh, line of reasoning. Because of man's sin, the earth was cursed. This was not an arbitrary curse. In other words, God say, don't eat this fruit, and if you eat it, uh, a lot of bad things are going to happen. Why? Because I told you so. This was not an arbitrary curse, but God merely stated the inevitable consequences of Adam's sin. So now, now she's talking as if there is something that is cause and effect going here versus something which would be of a more arbitrary nature. Now, when it comes to plants, and I've shown this earlier, I'm just throwing this up just as a, for some of you who may have not been to the, or heard the prior lectures, there is no question that weeds occur because of polyploidy, which is, the number of chromosomes, that we have uh, 46 chromosomes uh, in our body, and that's, uh, that's called, um, that we're euploid. If you have polyploid, that means you have many copies of chromosomes. All right? Not just, in our case, not just 46. So we would have to go up to 92 or higher. And I don't, didn't bring the slides today. There is no question that that only occurs in the presence of certain mobile genetic elements. There's no other, at this time, known mechanism where you can get polyploidy without mobile genetic elements there to uh, provide the necessary uh, environment for it to occur in. Here is just a, a looking at some of the weeds of North America. And if you look at the... Um, um, under New Zealand, if you come down through North America, you come to New Zealand on the introduced range, you see 4X, 5X, and 6X. This is where those weeds were introduced, or they were first found, and they have six, some of them have six times the number of chromosomes of uh, regular grass. All weeds come from, uh, have their origin in regular grasses. 
the grasses have been invaded by mobile genetic elements, which have in, ten, in, in the process caused polyploidy in some of them, and then they become very aggressive and become weeds. And uh, like I said, go to lecture four. We go through that very carefully. You can see uh, uh, references, um, whatever else you need to, to know on that subject. So going back to what Ellen White just said, when she linked what happened at the tree of, of uh, when Adam ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, she then goes right into a discussion of weeds and talks about amalgamation. And amalgamation, I think, um, well, my definition, I'll tell you what it is, and we can talk about this afterwards in questions and answers if you disagree, but my amalgamation, when you take her word amalgamation and if you take it to mean genetic material, then it would be bringing in mixing of foreign genetic material with what was originally there. Years ago, the Lord, this is her quoting her again, years ago, the Lord revealed to me that institutions should be established for treating the sick without drugs. Man is God's property and the room that has been made of the living habitation. The suffering caused by the seeds of death sown in the human system are an offense to God. Now, she mentioned those seeds of death that were planted in the system when the Satan tempted Adam to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. She's using the same term again. In drooping flower and falling leaf, Adam and his companion witnessed the first signs of decay. Vividly was brought to their mind the stern fact that every living thing must die. Even the air upon which their life depended bore the seeds of death. So she's using the word seeds of death again. Rebellion and apostasy are in the very air we breathe. We should be affected by them unless we by faith hang our helpless souls upon Christ. The reason I gave both of these statements is that as soon as Adam and Eve were put out of the garden, the inference is there was already something in the air which had seeds of death. If I said that we have seeds of death today, which the second one does, all you'd have to do is say I live in Southern California, I breathe smog. You're there. But I brought in this whole spectrum that it started from the very, from Adam and Eve and what we could presumably feel that the atmosphere was not um, heavily laced with hydrocarbons and, uh, and products of incom uh, incomplete combustion and all the other things that we have now. There would have been none of that there. Here, I had a number of articles, but here's one that clearly makes it the state. Uh, they all say the same thing. This put good numbers on it. It says, viral abundance exhibited a seasonal fluctuation in the range of between 1.7 times 10 to the 6th and 4.0 times 10 to the 7th viruses in each millimeter cubed of air. Meter cubed? Meter cubed, I'm sorry. Minus, it, 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 I'm, it should be a millimeter. Metagenomic characterization of airborne viral DNA diversity in the near surface atmosphere is the, is the name of the tar article. So in the springtime, you're going to have somewhere around 40 million viruses per millimeter of air. And in the fall, it goes down to 1.7 million. That's probably why you feel more energetic in the fall. Here's the point. If you take air and you go through and you analyze it, you're going to find that there is nitrogen and oxygen and carbon dioxide and a few other trace gases and viruses in the story. especially Adam and Eve's air. Unless they have a com diff completely different uh, respiratory system and, and uh, things than we have now. We have to assume that it's the same because we are their direct descendants. So when Ellen White makes a, the statement that the seeds of death were in the air, we can trace that all the way back to the tree of knowledge of good and evil because she uses the same term there. Eve had wandered near the forbidden tree, and her curiosity was aroused to know how death could be concealed in the fruit of this tree. Now, this is in confrontation. Uh, it, was, it was written again in confrontation, it was, which is a compilation of, uh, but this is, I gave you the review in Herald. Uh, you can go back and look at this um, article. You will see that she was talking in, in depth about the fall. 
And she was talking in, in confrontation. It's pages 12 and 13. And when she's talking about the fall, she was talking a very step by step what was happening to Eve as she went down the pathway. And what she states is, is that uh, Eve first looked at the tree because she looked up and she wasn't around Adam and she saw the tree and she thought, well, how could there be death in the fruit? And then it goes on two paragraphs later because some of you may say, well, Eve thought that, but she was wrong. But Ellen White doesn't say she was wrong, but two paragraphs later, Eve, um, uh, when the devil, devil asks her, well, did God say you can't eat of anything? And Eve says, no, we're not even supposed to touch. Ellen White goes in, touch the fruit. Ellen White goes clearly into the fact that Eve was wrong here. And because Eve had it wrong, and when the devil put the fruit in her hand, and she didn't feel any untoward effects, that at that point in time, she was sold on eating the fruit. And she makes a clear statement that Eve had not properly listened to what God had said, and because she had, um, was carrying around a wrong idea of what the, the prohibition was, that opened the door for her to then go ahead and actually transgress what God had said. Continually, they were reminded also of their lost dominion. Among the lower creatures, Adam had stood as king, and as so long as he remained loyal to God, all nature acknowledged his rule. But when he transgressed, this dominion was forfeited. The spirit of rebellion to which he himself had given entrance extended throughout the animal creation. Thus, not only the life of man, but the nature of the beasts, the trees of the forest, the grasses of the field, and the very air he breathed, there again, mentioned air, all told the sad lesson of the knowledge of evil. Now, everything in this uh, paragraph, other than Adam and Eve, is presumably unable to have a wrong opinion about God. And yet, they're included. So how do they get the, can, if, you know, I'm making my stipulation for this discussion because I've already given 20 hours of lecture that mobile genetic elements are at the base of this. So I'm going to use that now uh, uh, because I am building my ideas on what I had lectured about earlier. So how do the mobile genetic elements get everywhere else? If the way that they enter into the living organism is by believing a, uh, or by um, deciding against God. When Christ came, it was to a world disloyal to God, a world all seared and marred by the curse of rebellion. Since the fall, the arch deceiver had carried on his work with intense vigor until the course of transgression had fallen heavily upon the earth. Men were corrupted by Satan's invention. Although the earth was blighted with the curse, nature was still to be man's lesson book. It could not now represent goodness only, for evil was everywhere present, marring earth and sea and air, there is air again, with its defiling touch. Where once was written only the character of God, the knowledge of good, was now written also the character of Satan, the knowledge of evil. And notice she uses the word written. From nature, which now revealed the knowledge of good and evil, man was continually to receive a warning as to the results of sin. So what this is saying is we can look in nature and we can see what's caused a problem there. And this is a warning to us as to what is causing a problem in us. Her statements at first, first blush then seem to be contradictory. Is there a way all the statements can be taken together and still make sense? People communicate roughly 70% of the information exchanged is nonverbal. Hence, when reading a text, fully 70% of the content the speaker is trying to convey is lost. Consequently, when different people read the script, multiple divergent ideas can be gleaned from the same piece. The only way to obtain the original meaning that the author intended was to contact him or her to set the record straight, a luxury not afforded us in this discussion. Which now leads to my intent in coming here to talk today. My intent 
is not to come here and if there are those out, out in the audience which feel that there couldn't have been something in the fruit, my, my intent was not that I was going to come and persuade you. Because I don't think that's how people change their opinion of things. I think it's much more complex. What I'm here today to do is explain to you why I think there was. And then you can look at it and make up your own decision as to whether, in your opinion, I made sense or I didn't. So I'm simply here doing the very unenviable position of saying I'm willing to put out on the table what I believed happened and let you, uh, during questions and answers, come after me if you so wish to defend my position. But I'm not necessarily, my intent was not to come here and make you all committed to this view. Okay. Let me give you an example of what I was what we had just read about 70% of uh, information is nonverbal. Let's take this sentence, I never promised you the money. Now, when you read that on the screen, you, you may, all of us may have somewhat of a slightly different idea, but now watch what happens when I read to you this same sentence with different emphasis. I never promised you the money. Someone down the street promised you the money, but I didn't promise you the money. I never promised you the money. I promised you other things in the estate, but I never promised you the money. I never promised you the money. I said I might give it to you, but I didn't ever promise and say I absolutely would give you the money. I never promised you the money. Yes, I did promise the money, but it wasn't to you. I never promised you the money. I have promised you money in the past, but I didn't promise you the money we're talking about now. I never promised you the money. Now I promised you everything else in the estate, but I never promised you money. Same sentence, which is read on the screen, and there are other variable ways of interpreting it, but do you notice the way I presented it changed the, con changed the meaning? And that's the problem we have here. We are writ fixed with written words. And this is why it's my belief that the Bible is this long, is because God has had to communicate with written word, and therefore it takes a lot longer, a lot more examples and um, <clears throat> thought on our part in order to really be able to get out what the, in or what the intended meaning is. What did Christ say? Let him, um, oh, my father-in-law, who's now deceased, his name was Dick Neese, he was, uh, got a, uh, two PhDs in psychology, and when he was getting his second PhD at UCLA, uh, he had been a minister and he transi and transitioned into psychology. Uh, he was listening to the radio on the way home, and this gentleman got on the radio, this was in the mid-60s, and he started to absolutely go apoplectic over the fact that women were twirling their hair up. Remember the beehives that in the 60s, those of you who, uh, may, I'm dating myself here, I see blink looks on half the audience, which means those of us who are a little older will remember that they would pile the hair up quite high in sort of like a beehive. And he was saying that this was a moral sin and that the Bible clearly indicated that you were not the women were not to wear their hair that way. And he gave us his text, Matthew 24, 17, and he quoted, top not come down. <laughs> that was his text, and he gave it as Matthew 24, 17. So, when Christ said to the uh, rich young ruler in Luke 11, who came to him and said, you know, what do I, um, what are the greatest commandments? And, and Christ said, well, how readest thou? And then he said, well, you know, love the neighbors yourself, love God and with all your heart and your neighbors yourself. And he said, yes, you're right. You're not far from the kingdom. Why would Christ answer him and say, how readest thou? 
This was the first one who really asked his opinion, wasn't coming to, to ostensibly trap him, although truth of the matter he was, but he was going to do it with a question and answer. Instead, Christ says, well, how do you read it? I don't know where to start our discussion until I know how you're reading things, and then we can start the discussion. This is an inherent problem that we have, and I'm not convinced it's a bad problem because it forces people to think and dig and read. The fruit of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden possessed supernatural values. Now, we're going to go get some other comments of Ellen White which aren't directly related to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Okay, We're going to go mining and get a few other things to put together on the table, and we're going to try to put the pieces, of the, well, I'm going to try to put the pieces of the puzzle together. The fruit of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden possessed supernatural value. To eat of it was to live forever. <laughs> Its fruit was the antidote of death. Its leaves were for the sustaining of life and immortality. But through man's disobedience, death entered the world. I put in red what I wanted us to, cure, to key in on. Its fruit was the antidote to death. The tree of life was a type of the one great source of immortality. Wow, she's going to compare the tree of life's fruit to Christ. Of Christ it is written, in human in him was life, and the life was the light of men. He is the fountain of life. Obedience to him is the life-giving, vivifying power that gladdens the soul. Through sin, man shut himself off from access to the tree of life. Now, life and immortality are brought to life through Jesus Christ. So she compares the tree of life to Christ here. That's a pretty big comparison. Not only was the fruit, uh, fruit of the tree of life an anecdote to the effects of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it was required for a mortal life even in a sinless state. I had, before I made this talk, I spent two weeks and I read everything in Ellen White that I could find that had anything to do with the tree of no, uh, uh, knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And in trying to put together a talk which would not keep us here until 4 this afternoon, I obviously had to call out just the main um, quotes that I felt would carry, would represent all, question, all sides in this uh, discussion. The two statements that I made earlier I thought were the most um, um, clear. We're going to get some more statements in other areas where there it's going to refer, refer to the tree of life and it's going to make the statement again that the only way that Adam and Eve could have immortal life was to eat of the tree of life. Everything was contingent upon that. And this was even in the sinless state. This is not hard to find in her writings. Um, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 60 is a good place to start if you want. In order to possess an endless existence, man must continue to partake of the tree of life. Deprived of this, his vitality would gradually diminish until he should become extinct. After his disobedience, he was not suffered to eat of the tree of life and perpetuate a life of sin. We're going to come back to that. In order for man to possess an endless life, he must continue to eat of the fruit of the tree of life. Deprived of that tree, his life would gradually wear out. Deprived of that tree for whatever reason, Even if he hadn't have eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, she makes it clear he had to continue. And so he would have been in a sinless state. In order for him to have eternal life, he had to eat of the fruit of life. The ultimate cause of death for Adam and Eve was not eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but being de deprived of access to the tree of life. Because we heard earlier, it was the anecdote to death, right? And the Lord said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. We're going to come to forever here. I'm going to zero in on this in a second. I think that that translation, uh, at least you should understand the Hebrew and the root words where it came from before, we, um, before you, as you think of the word forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So God even says, the Bible even validates this. If Adam and Eve had been able to eat of the tree of life, after they eat of, after they eat of the knowledge of good and evil's fruit, they would have lived forever. 
And Ellen White makes it, in, uh, if you go back to Genesis 2, where God first starts talking about the tree of life, and he says to Adam, you know, this is the tree of life. You need to eat this to live forever. So it, we have it both sides. It, no matter where you are in this continuum, sin or no sin, in order for you to have eternal life, you have to eat of the tree of life. And this is looking at that word that means forever that we just saw. Uh, up, up here you'll see and live forever. You notice I've circled it in red, H5769. This is looking into um, Strong's um, concordance. I'm not, sorry, this is Briggs, uh, driver, uh, Brown, Driver, and Briggs. But um, it's another biblical concordance. And if you look up the TWOT, which gives us a, um, an idea of where else it's used in the Bible and how it's used and where its root word comes from, I underlined in red, it says, such usages generally point to something that seems long ago, but rarely if ever is referred to as a limited past. The problem is, is a good percentage of the time, the word that used here that's translated as forever is, is also used to talk about events that her, happened way in the distant past. In fact, a good percentage of the time that word is used, it's to refer to something that not being infinitive in the past, past, but it was a distance in the past, but it did actually happen in the past. And it also uses this word elsewhere in the Old, Old Testament, referring to something that's going to happen in the distant future, but it's not limitless. It will eventually come about. So when we read what God said there, I would suggest that it's uh, given the rules of the road, if we look at how else it's used in the, Old, in the Old Testament, it would not be a stretch to say what God was saying. If he continues to eat of the, true, of the tree of life, he will go on living for a very, very long time. Is there any evidence that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was ever on the earth when the tree of life was not nearby to it? We don't have any evidence that that's the case. Now, as I see it, we have three options. There's probably more, but there's the three main options that I hear people discuss, and so I'm going to get, I'm going to limit myself to those three. God and the adversary made an agreement that if Adam and Eve should eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, then God would escort the pair out of the garden and allow the devil access to them, and in the process, deprive them of access to the tree of life. None of us were there. We're in this discussion, we're limiting our, um, uh, our resources to the Bible and Ellen White, and that's it. So we, we've, I've, I've, I think I've given you a fair, impartial cross-section, brief as it may be, of Ellen White's statements, and the Bible doesn't have very many. So we've sort of got a good, at least a good feeling for what's out there. This could have happened. I wasn't there. Um, number two, believing the devil's lies about God caused such derangements of their minds that the consequences of sin naturally flowed from purely mental causes. Plus, they would be denied access to the tree of life. That's another option that I've, that I've had brought up to me. Three, something was in the fruit which would not cause death or injury to them, but would make it impossible for them to stay in the garden. And as you might guess, that's the one I'm going to be talking about more uh, in just a few moments. But first, let's go to the first two. God and the adversary make an agreement that if Adam and Eve should eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, then God would escort the pair out of the garden. In other words, if you guys eat this fruit, it's an irrevocable vote to be on the devil's side, and no matter what you say or think afterwards, I'm escorting you out and I'm handing you over to him because we made a deal. And I keep my deal. They could have been ushered out. Mobile genetic elements could have been waiting for them, or shortly thereafter they were ushered out, and we could have gotten into the position we're in now. Pros, all of Ellen White's statements that I've uh, told you up to this point um, could fit. And the ones where the seeds of death, well, you could argue, well, but 
yes, this, the seeds of death were planted very quickly thereafter as soon as they were escorted out. So that, you know, let's give her some literary license here. There are some cons. They're not overwhelming cons, but they're cons. Uh, the physical changes in Adam and Eve prior to their expulsion from the garden. Um, they hadn't been pushed outside yet where they could get um, the devil's un uh, um <coughs> full attention. And yet they lose the, the robe of light. They become somewhat cantankerous with each other. They feel it's cold. They feel anxiety for the first time. I'm, I'm summarizing Ellen White. They go get large leaves from the, some of the plants, pull them off, and start covering themselves. And, th and then they start having a real discussion like maybe we shouldn't have eaten of that fruit. There's this, this may be a problem. And then she goes on to say that they said, well, he's a loving God and he'll know that we were sorry and he'll, th he can't really mean what he said about death and I, he'll probably take us back and we'll be okay. Number two, now this is going to science. Why would reptiles, and copperhead snakes in particular, who have no moral choice, have the largest per capita mobile genetic element load of any of the other animals? In fact, copperhead snakes, uh, well, I just said, have an equal infestations of humans. Humans, we clearly can say the most conservative estimates out there, 66% of our genome has been replaced with something new and something that's very bad, unless you need, uh, need it to drive speciations and you're an evolutionist. Other than that, it's bad. Um, given that, why would snakes, who have presumably no ability to believe or distrust God, or if we're, do we're dealing here with the being ushered out of the garden scenario, why should they be uh, put on the hook for uh, a big load of this stuff and if you remember in lecture five I went through the fact that snakes the reason why snakes don't grow wings anymore is because a mobile genetic element has shut off the ability to express that part the wing bud in comparison to a chicken and has also shut off the ability to have a pelvis and legs so why would that happen this now would, and you could say, well, God did it to prove a point. Well, now, now we're bordering on what I would call arbitrary. Snake had no choice in the matter. Snake is used by the devil. And God says, uh, I don't care, snakes, that you had no culpability in all this. I'm going to make an example out of you. And you can't fly anymore. And you can't walk around. Do, you can't look like you used to. You're going to have to eat dust. Let's look at number two. Believing the devil's lies about God caused such derangements of their minds that the consequences of sin naturally flowed from purely mental causes. Plus, they would be denied access to the tree of life. Prose. It's compatible, very compatible, with the first couple of statements of Ellen White that I wrote to you. That would fit right in. And plus, I would have to say, when you read everything, Ellen White spends a lot of time, instead of way more time than this, the statements I have put out here discussing whether or not there was something in the fruit, she talks about the fact that what is at stake here is that Adam and Eve l distrusted God, distrusted him as their creator, and that this was the real issue because if they distrusted him, uh, this opened the door to all of their problems. I grant you that they're there and they're everywhere. And we're going to discuss that at the very end uh, of this presentation, if I can get there. Cons, how did all living human organisms be affected by sin when presumably um, they cannot believe a lie about God? You know, how, did, how did the rest of creation get a, uh, get, get a dose of this and why? Since sin is inherited, Romans 5.12 said this, then, then sin must be present in the genome. There is no known evidence that thinking changes DNA sequences in the neurons, much less non-CNS or germ cells. Now, some of you may say, yes, but how do you get memory in the hippocampus? What about those cells? Those are, that's all done through epigenetic processes where different parts of the um, stem, neural stem cell that comes in to form the anchor neuron in that uh, circuit have epigenetic changes in the form of methylation that allow only certain select parts of that genome to be transcribed. And in the process, it differentiates that genome 
I mean, the genome of that neuron and differentiates it to become part of this um, circuit. It's epigenetic. It doesn't change the code itself. It changes something around the code. It changes the way that the code and that neuron is going to be read, read from here on out until uh, the circuit is, if it's not used, is, is uh, brought into disuse and then that neuron can join other circuits. But it's an epigenetic process and that's why the neuron can join other circuits is because you can change the methylation and change the way it's transcribed and now that neuron can join and become part of another circuit. So how do you get believing something about God to change not only the neurons in the brain, uh, their DNA, but to change the, neuro the DNA throughout the body and most, most specifically down in the gametes, the ovum and the sperm. There is absolutely no scientific evidence today that that can occur. And a guy in the past by the name of Lamarck, or Lamarck A, however you want to say it, proposed that at the same time of Darwin. And you can go look that up and read uh, how that's been refuted. Nowadays, they're starting to come back a little bit because they're going into epigenetics and seeing that epigenetics can, we can pass down uh, traits from the parents uh, to the children. And in lecture two, I go through that very extensively. It's called parental imprinting. And, but that's epigenetic. It doesn't change the code. It just changes how the code's read. By E.G. White's own account, Adam and Eve were genuinely sorry after being confronted by God, and there was no evidence that they still believed anything that the devil had told Eve. So in worst case scenario, they believed a lie for a few hours at most. Now just stepping back a moment and just looking at this whole picture, does that seem fair? Adam and Eve believed a lie for a couple of hours, and it opened up the door for everything that we've had since then for 7,000 years. How many in this room have not belie ever believed a lie? We all have. Doesn't that seem like a very stringent um, sequelae to believing a lie? And that would, in my opinion, open the creator up open for questions about his ability to engineer a system that's that fragile that you believe a lie and that uh, it, it would uh, deteriorate. Mm, this, this would add another problem to it because all of us have been scammed at some point. You're first victimized by scamming, and here, if this is to be followed, then you're guilty for having been scammed. Right. Uh, there is something wrong with that entire scenario. Well, that's why I'm putting this up as one of the cons. Quoting Ellen White, when Adam and Eve realized how exalted and sacred was the law of God, the transgression of which made so costly a sacrifice necessary to save them and their posterity from utter ruin, they pleaded to die themselves or to let them and their posterity endure the penalty of their transgression rather than that the beloved son of God should make this great sacrifice. The anguish of Adam was increased. He saw that his sins were of so great a magnitude as to involve fearful consequences. This is not a description of Ellen White of someone who has believed a lie about God and is now at totally at enmity with him and um, is um, to a point where it has changed his whole being and his outlook. This talks about someone who was fooled and then r was shown evidence that they had been fooled and now we're left with the, the, the um, serious uh, 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 regret, buyer's remorse. After their sin, Adam and Eve were no longer to dwell in Eden. They earnestly entreated that they might remain in the home of their innocence and joy. They confessed that they had forfeited all right to their happy abode, but pledged themselves for the future to yield strict obedience to God. I'm sorry, I don't know how the uh, reference got left off, but I can get it for you if some of you are interested afterwards. Here is the point. There was many more that I could have put up, but due to time, I only picked two. The, if thinking or believing something wrong about God was the cause of sin, why didn't God warn them that in the day that you think to eat, dying thou shalt die? And why is it that every human since Adam and Eve has contracted a sinful predis predisposition via hereditary and not via a thinking process? And that's proven if you've ever seen a two or a three-year-old. They're extremely selfish and self-centered. 
They have not had a chance to believe a lie about God. They are thoroughly what we would, what I would call a very, very uh, good exemplification of a totally selfish being. And they, are, they have no capabilities of even, m many of them, understanding who God is, much less dis uh, disagreeing with his uh, dictums. How does one handle the following EGY statement, if believing a lie is the entry point of sin, where she said, from Adam's day to ours, there has been a succession of falls, each greater than the last. And in every species of crime, God did not create a race of beings so devoid of health, beauty, and moral power as now exists on the earth. Disease of every kind has been fearfully increasing upon the race. This has not been by God's special providence, but directly contrary to his will. It has come by man's disregard of the very means which God has ordained to shield him from the terrible evils existing. Obedience to God's law in every respect would save men from intemperance, licentiousness, and disease of every type. No one can violate natural law without suffering the penalty. Now, natural law, we think of the three laws of thermodynamics. We think of gravity. And I made the argument in my first uh, lecture one of this series that it also, it's, as it deals with us specifically, would be the natural law would be our genetics, our law of genetics that uh, codes um, everything. I just have to throw this. I'm going to little tidbit here. Uh, my good friend, Doc, Dr. Michael Webster, gave me a paper as I was getting on the plane, which um, points out with the Hawk system, which I talked about earlier, that um, uh, in a, I think it was the last lecture, that in the Hawk system now they have uh, been able to come up with the fact that it has every cell in your body labeled and knows where it is. It has a zip code. It has a zip code. You have 100 trillion cells. And those Hox genes have a number, or, and I'm using that in quotes because it's not a number, it's obviously coded differently. But in, in our parlance, they have a number for all where those cells are and how they should be and what they should be doing. So that's natural law. When you get in and you start messing that up, you're going to start having serious consequences. And we are reaping that, in my opinion, now. Now for option number three. Something was in the fruit which would not cause death or injury to them, but would make it impossible for them to stay in the garden. I'm going to give you a scenario to start from the beginning to end is how I would explain it. So that's going to be what I'm giving as a pro. And the con, I'm going to leave it up to you to decide. Before constructing our scenario, we need some further statements from Ellen G. White and science. So I'm going to bring in some other things now that I've culled from science from Ellen White, or I'm going to put them on the table. And then I'm going to try to put them like a, um, a large puzzle. I'm going to try to take all the pieces and put them together, and hopefully we'll get a somewhat, somewhat uh, visible picture at the end. First of all, we need to note that the devil did not wish to harm Adam and Eve, much less kill them. In his original decision to go after them, and that's what we're going to talk about now, it was not his intent to kill them. Where I'm going to show you he wanted them to be his hostages. Why would you kill your hostages <laughs> before you've made your demands? His followers were seeking him, him being the devil. And he roused himself and, assuming a look of defiance, informed them of his plans to wrest from God the noble Adam and his companion Eve. If he could in any way beguile them to disobedience, God would make some provision whereby they, Adam and Eve, might be pardoned, and then himself and all the fallen angels would be in a fair way to share with them of God's mercy. If they should fail to obtain pardon, they would unite with Adam and Eve, whose transgression would place them also in a state of rebellion, and thus they would take possession of Eden and hold it as their home. And if they could gain access to the tree of life in the midst of the garden, their strength, they thought, would be equal to that of the holy angels, and God himself cannot expel them. And if you read before and after, this actually comes from an article, which is God and Christ and his angels versus the devil and his angels. That's the title of the, of the, of the Signs of the Time article. What the devil was saying here is, look, um, we're, we're in a bad place. Remember, he asked for an audience with Christ. And, you want, and when he, the audience with Christ came, he said, I've changed my mind. I want to come back. Can you take me back? And Christ said to him, 
no, I can't take you back. And started to, and it said Christ started to cry. After that, in this scenario, comes the following statements, where the devil then went off to think, and he left his an- the rest of his angels behind. And in that process, he began to try to think of what he could do. And he brought up to them before leaving that maybe they could tempt Adam and Eve. And he went off to think about it. And he went back and forth on the issue because the thought, at that point in time at least, caused him serious pause. And then his followers, who were left to think about whether they would agree to go out after Adam and Eve or not, this is where this paragraph comes in. They came back to tell him they were in. Let's go after Adam and Eve. And then that follows what he says next. He says, you know, here's my plan. We'll get them to fall. And when they fall, we get mobile genetic elements in them. Then when God comes and finds a way to get them out, then whatever, and, I, and here's a presupposition, and we're not going to talk about it today, and this is a, an assumption I'm making in this talk I should have declared earlier, that the, the devil, did, since he's a created being, did something to his information system. That's breaking God's law. He caused us to do something to our information system. Well, he did it to us. We opened the door. So that's, in our instance, also breaking God's law. So whatever the devil did to his information system could be at the same time if God's going to work one way out for Adam and Eve, then he's going to work one way. He, then they, God can't say that there's nothing I can do for you. If that fails, we're going to get a, new, a whole army of people to join us because Adam and Eve will have children. And plus, we'll get access to the tree of life. Now, whether we could sit here and debate whether the devil, whether angels eat or not. Psalm 78 talks about eating angels' food, that the Israelites were eating angels' food. And Ellen White also talks about in early writings, right around page 40 where she saw the devil as he used to be and then how he is now and that he has changed dramatically his forehead is going straight back the skin is hanging from his arms and that he is a gaunt figure those are when you read that um, by the way you will find that the way she describes him is looks is, is the same thing that happens to us when we age same thing exactly her description now versus how he looked originally but the important thing is she then goes on to say that when the devil is getting ready to tempt someone and as he's being successful this evil smile comes across his face so the devil must have teeth so then the question is well do they eat we don't know but there is at least evidence out there that would support the fact that they do but it's immaterial. If the devil wants access to the tree of life, if, he's, if it's not through eating, if it's extracting whatever bioactive chemicals are involved in, in, in somehow else getting them to a system is irrelevant to our discussion. I was just uh, chasing a little sidebar there. Secondly, the devil wanted to have Adam and Eve eat of the tree of life because it would render them eternally under his power. It was Satan's study plan that Adam and Eve should disobey God, receive his frown, and then partake of the tree of life that they might perpetuate a life of sin. Now, the question we should ask here is, well, let's suppose the devil does tempt Adam and Eve. They eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They are put outside of the, and then, but before they could be put outside of the garden, Eve also brought along a few pieces of the tree of life, and they both ate the tree of life. Would that mean that there was no plan of salvation available to them? Does eating of the tree of life preclude a plan of salvation? Let's look on. It was Satan's plan that Adam and Eve should by disobedience incur God's displeasure. And then if they failed to obtain forgiveness, he hoped that they would eat of the tree of life. Notice he wa- every time it talks, almost every time that she talks about uh, uh, the devil wanting to get them to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he also wants them to eat of the tree of life. It's... Uh, I'm not saying there's not one statement where she doesn't couple the two, but by the vast majority of the time, she couples the two. He hoped that they would eat of the tree of life and thus perpetuate an existence of sin and misery. But then it says, after man's fall, angels stopped it. And let's go down to the bottom. It says, hence, there is not an immortal sinner. You see, it wouldn't have been easy, too. God could have said to, uh, to uh, Adam and Eve, okay, go ahead and eat of the tree of life. You're going to live forever. I'll institute a plan of salvation. And then, guess what? Christ won't have to come and die because you're going to live forever anyway, if you take the, the literal words, uh, the way it's written in King James. I say it's, con- it's still predicated on continuing to eat it. 
And I think we showed that, I showed that earlier, both in Ellen White and even looking at the biblical account. So you can't eat once of the tree of life and live forever because Adam and Eve ate of the tree of life before they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They didn't live forever. So eating of the tree of life does not in of itself convey eternal life. It's continually eating of the tree of life that gives you con uh, eternal life. So it says, hence there is not an immortal sinner. Uh, it talks about the news of man's fall. It goes through heaven. The angels feared that they would put forth the hand and eat of the tree of life and thus perpetuate a life of sin. Adam and Eve. Adam was driven from Eden, and the angels who before his transgression had been appointed to guard him in his Eden home were now appointed to guard the gates of paradise that the way, uh, and the way, of the, tree, the way to the tree of life, lest he should return, gain access to the tree of life. Now does it say, and he would be immortalized? No, it said sin will be immortalized. We've already showed you earlier, you have to keep eating of the tree of life to keep living. You can't, eating of it once doesn't mean you live forever. Adam and Eve ate of it already. So what, 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 what she is making clear here is that sin would be immortalized. Uh, I wonder if you could draw a parallel between the development of immortality in cancer cells compared to normal cells under these circumstances. Well, I would love to. The answer is yes, I can. And the answer is no, you don't want to hear it right now. It's got a lot of genetics, and we don't want to go there. Apparently, God removed the pair from the garden for their own good. Had they been permitted to stay and eat of the tree of life's fruit, there would have been no plan of salvation avail available to redeem them. Why do you think that the two angels that were guarding Adam and Eve, as soon as they ate the fruit, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil in confrontation. Ellen White says they went immediately and guarded the tree of life so that the pair couldn't get there. Adam listened to the words of the tempter and yielded to his insinuations, fell into sin. Why was not the death penalty at once enforced in this case? Because a ransom was found. God's only begotten son volunteered to take the sin of man upon himself and to make an atonement for the fallen race. There could have been no pardon for sin had this atonement not been made. Had God pardoned Adam and Eve's sin without an atonement, in other words, through Christ's death and coming to this earth, sin, not Adam and Eve, sin would have been immortalized and would have been perpetuated with a boldness that would have been without restraint. So if God had said, okay, you guys get a mulligan, I'll let you back in, you can eat at the tree of life and whatever else is in the garden, this is what it says would have happened. There would, she doesn't mention anything that there could have been a plan of salvation at this point. What she says here, to me, says the opposite. Third, we now look to science to see if it can shed any light that we have on the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This was an article <coughs> that was um, printed in 2009. And what they found out is that people, there were, it seems to be about 5%, give or take, of the population that seems to be immune from getting HIV. And the, so they wanted to find out what is it that causes people, why are this select portion of the population not, why don't they get HIV? And one of the first things they found, which is not the only thing, but is felt to be very crucial and certainly at the very front of the reasons why, there are some other reasons, but this seems to be a predominant one, is that, and I'm gonna read this, human alpha and beta defenses contribute substantially to innate immune defenses against microbial and viral infection. Certain non-human primates also produce theta defenses. 18 residue cycle peptides that act as HIV-1 entry inhibitors. Multiple human theta defensin genes exist, but they harbor a premature termination codon that blocks translation. Consequently, the theta defenses, the retrocyclins, encoded within the human genome are not expressed as peptides. Okay, here's the, here's the, they found that in this 5% of people, instead of having at a premature stop codon on the theta defensins, they didn't have that, and they were able to produce the theta defensins, and this, to at least a large degree, made them not susceptible to HIV uh, inoculation. Um, 
Our study reveals for the first time to our knowledge that human cells have the ability to make cyclic theta defensins. Given this evidence that human cells could make theta defensins, we attempted to restore endogenous expression of retrocyclin peptides. What they did is they gave erythromycin, which overrode the uh, stop codon, and th the human cells were able to m produce these theta defensins. And now why is this so important? Because the, va the vast majority of mobile genetic elements are retro, which is RNA. HIV is an RNA virus. In fact, human endogenous retroviruses are in the very same family as, as uh, HIV and also human uh, lymphocytic virus. All of those three are, come from the same area because, and you can tell this by their um, protein code, coding and other uh, enzymes that they carry in them. So, if you, have, if you had this defense system in, then the retro elements, of which majority of mobile genetic elements are, this would be a, would block their entry into the cell. So something had to get into, would have to get into the cell and put this stop codon into their natural theta defensins so that the cells would no longer produce it, which now opens the door for any type of retro element to get in. How, how long, I'm sorry, what's your question? It's 11.45 and he was wondering whether we would have a discussion. Oh, uh, well, if I stop for discussion now, I have not gotten to where I need to go. So I apologize if the, those of you have to leave, uh, go ahead and leave. Um, until I get to my end point, I, it does no good to discuss because you're going to bring something up and I'll say, yeah, but I answer this in the next four slides. So that's the problem we're going to have. I apologize. Uh, here's a quick look at the, um, notice that the first one at the very top, top are DNA transposons. And what's important is that they were original one. If you, I don't know if you can read down there. It says types of transposable elements in mammals. Mariner-like DNA transposons are inactive relics in mammalian genomes. Retro transposons that contain many but not all of the activities necessary for the family. This article shows out that there was a sequence, it appears, at which these mobile genetic elements were introduced in the system. And the first mobile genetic elements were the transposases or transposons, which were DNA. So they could have gotten into the cell. The beta defensins would have no effect of whether they could get into the cell or not. Okay, that's very important. Then the other four that are listed there seem to have been in introduced sequentially. And the reason they know this is mobile genetic elements have a high tendency to, to mutate. And you can, as you look back through these, you can see that the oldest ones are the most mutated. The other thing you should know about the transposons is that they are, uh, they are a cut and paste, not a copy paste. So that's very important. In other words, you, when you get a certain number of them in, put into the genome, they're not going to multiply. They may m try to move around, but they're not going to multiply. And in the human genome right now, the vast percentage, and I can't say all because we don't know where they all are, but the vast percentage of those that are found are methylated and locked down. They're not functioning anymore. They're called relics of the past because they cannot do what the retro can do, which is copy and paste. So the retro gets in. They can make many different copies, like a copy machine, and send it throughout the genome. And, they, and when, when they get to a new spot, those guys can intend to make more and more and more. So the body's ability to fight against this uh, it, it exhausts the cell and eventually it dies in trying to do this very uh, project. Now let's put it together. The devil is informed that Christ can do nothing to allow him and his apostate angels back into heaven during a meeting outside of the New Jerusalem. This is my scenario now, so I'm starting it here. Satan then devises a plan whereby he feels that he can force God's hand into, vi into devising a way in which he and his followers can be reinstated into heaven. This plan is to have Adam and Eve eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, wherein the devil has placed DNA in mobile genetic elements, the original early transposases. Once, and the, uh, uh, the being is, is that they would go in and knock out by putting a stop code on next to the, uh, in the theta defensins, amongst other unidentified areas. 
So th I'm not saying this is the only one. I'm using this as an example of what they did, and there was probably other things that they did. Uh, once Adam and Eve are inoculated, God will not let them perish and will devise a plan whereby the pair's information system can be remedied. Among other potentially unknown tasks, the MGEs and the fruit were engineered to destroy their innate defenses against RNA mobile genetic elements. The mobile genetic elements in the fruit are not engineered to cause death or physical injury. And I'm, I'm quoting Ellen White's two statements uh, earlier where she said that they did not cause injury or death. They do, however, render Adam and Eve his hostages, for now he has the ability to invade the genomes with very virulent forms of mobile genetic elements, the RNA variety, the retro variety, capable of entirely rewriting their code. Their theta defenses have been silenced, amongst other things. Adam and Eve, here's, I'm quoting Ellen White, Adam and Eve were informed that they must lose their Eden home. They had yielded to Satan's deception and believed that God would lie. By their transgression, they had opened the way for Satan to gain access to them more readily, and it was not safe for them to remain in the Garden of Eden, lest in their state of sin they gain access to the tree of life and perpetuate sin. Going down, they were informed that in their fall from innocence to guilt, they had gained no strength but great weakness. They had not preserved their integrity while they were in a state of holy, happy innocence, and they would have far less strength to remain loyal and true in a state of conscious guilt. At these words, the unhappy pair were filled with the keenest anguish and remorse. Now, they now realize that the penalty of sin was death. If God devises a way to remove the mobile genetic elements from Adam and Eve, then the devil and his companions can demand the same be done to them. If God does not comply, then the plan is for Adam and Eve to eat of the tree of life. Um, <clears throat> renting them internally under his control. They and their children will supply a ready army to aid in the upcoming civil war. Also, the fruit of the tree of life could make Satan and his followers stronger so that the next time they meet Christ and the loyal angels in battle, the devil will fare better. Uh, I'm just going to read what I've underlined. God would make some provision whereby they might be pardoned. This is talking to the devil. And then himself and, and all the fallen angels would be in a fair way to share with them in God's mercy. And then down at the bottom, and if they could gain access to the tree of life in the midst of the garden, their strength would, they thought, be equal to that of holy angels, and even God cannot expel them. Adam and Eve partake of the forbidden fruit. Their two guardian angels immediately take guard around it, a tree of life to prevent the pair from gaining access to the fruit. God removes the pair from the garden and in so doing preserves their ability to respond to a plan of salvation. Realizing that God has responded with a totally unexpected object option, um, and there will be uh, no dealing for the hostages. The devil turns all his energies into destroying God's handiwork, especially Adam and Eve. The devil then sequentially introduces new models of mobile genetic elements over time, each complementary and better suited to cause addiction, injury, and death, with the intent of totally deranging the human machinery. And in so doing, he strikes back at God. In other words, once he realized that his plan, as he had hatched it, and I'm using Ellen White's scenario, you can go look them up, what she said, wasn't going to work, then he said, okay, now I'm out to, to cause them harm. Because, and Ellen White says in other places, by causing uh, the human race misery, the devil is able to strike back at God, and he feels that that's his only way now of getting back. Um, it talks about uh, crime would increase through successive generations, and the curse of sin would rest more and more heavily upon the human race upon beasts, upon the earth. In other words, this was going to be an increasing thing. It's not a static one. It's going to continually get worse. And if you look at um, the ages uh, of um, humankind, and I went back to Adam, notice how there is a, a, well, there's a steep curve at the flood. There's some hypotheses of why that's the case. But the idea is, is that the, um, these mobile genetic elements have been increasing in number. And it is my hypothesis that there, although there were a small amount originally placed, once the retro elements got in, that the, uh, by our, as Ellen White says, uh, we haven't listened to God's prohibitions. We have uh, gone ahead as a human race and done what we wanted. That has enabled them to um, multiply. And now they are, the, they are the greater preponderance of our genome. In summary, Adam and Eve were tested on the ultimate question. Who do you choose to program you and your environment? 
Now, if you stop for a moment, that is the ultimate question. All other questions come from this. Now, if suppose one of you had a child that had, heaven forbid, a, a, an AVM, uh, atrial venous malformation, and you had to go to a neurosurgeon to have it removed, would you just go down to the, to the local uh, community hospital and say, I'd like this done, and whoever comes in the door, it's fine by me. Let's just hope they're competent. Or would you get on the phone and would you look around everywhere to try to find somebody, the best possible person that is capable of, of removing this lesion? This has only to do with this child's AVM. What, what if we now change the whole what's up, what's at stake to you entirely and your entire environment? That's why I believe Ellen White spends so much time talking about trusting God and, 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 and having the right conception of him because what we're handing over to God is the ability or to the devil to not only deal, to deal every aspect of our lives and in our environment. And this is the whole enchilada, you can't get any bigger. This is the question of which all the others will, will, will come. This is the foundation if you've got to start here in order to go elsewhere. All right, I'm done. Hour and 15 minutes, I didn't make an hour, Paul, I'm sorry. <coughs> Comments or questions? Okay, your whole scenario is based on the devil's needing to take hostages to gain his salvation. So why would there not have been a way then backing up for God to have put in a plan of salvation for the devil? Well, let me make two statements here. The first is, I'm referring to what Ellen White said, since this is Ellen White is the person who's made the statements that's necessitated this talk, I'm giving what she said. So, but I will say that there, that's a very interesting question. And we aren't given any information on it that I can find anywhere. I can make some guesses, but guesses are guesses, and everybody's guess, you know, the world is filled up with them, and most of the guesses are wrong. So I would simply try, not trying to duck the question because I have some ideas, I would just like to say that that's not been revealed to us and Ellen White makes it very clear that when there's areas that God has not revealed to us, the, the silence is golden. So I'm, I'm not going to go out there and venture a bunch of hypotheses because I could be very wrong and I don't want to sow that seed, if I can use that not, pun not intended, out there. I just don't want to do it. Uh, so through uh, genetic engineering, uh, could we uh, could reverse the effects of sin and, and uh, sort of produce our own tree of life through technology? Good question. And the answer is no, and I hate to refer you to this, but I spend time on this on, the, on uh, science of sin and salvation. There's a reason why you can't, um, there's a reason why it is we are totally incapable of removing um, this much of our genome. First of all, we can't do it. It multiplies so quickly. But let's say for a moment that science progresses and there's a way now that we could selectively uh, identify the mobile genetic elements. And that's a big problem. The only way we identify it is two ways. One, we find that the code is different. They have different stop codons, start codons, and things of that nature. And we also infer it because the body is working against those areas of the genome. And, and the way it it does it, it makes them into heterochromatin. It covers them up with uh, a protein sheath and puts them elsewhere and on the outside of the nucleus. So, but let's suppose we could do that. Here's the problem. That you have um, a couple of, uh, you've got a setup, we have a setup in our gen genome, which if you start taking, putting too much new information in or taking information out, it shuts down, the shell shuts down, it's called apoptosis. The capsaic system is the name of the system that does that. So you, we are limited. We cannot go in and start making wholesale changes, the cell dies. Also, we can't go through, uh, the problem is worse than this. Each cell has a different infection than the cell next to it. It's called mosaicism. And if you read the genetic literature, it's replete with mosaicism. In fact, one of the big reasons we have in our brains is that we have mosaicism in our brains. Neurons right next to each other have actually 
a different code in the genome. They're not identical. And so um, now you've got a new problem. Each cell has got a different infestation. And there's a hundred, approximately a hundred trillion of them, give or take. There is no way we could, we would have, it would be an impossibility to take it out of one cell. Now trying to take it out of a hundred trillion would be an absolute total non-starter. So this is a very, very bad situation. And Ellen White says that the redeemed will for the eternity be looking into the plan of salvation. Back before, uh, 10 years ago, before I got onto this genetic kick, I thought that we would sit and we would, as awe-inspiring and moving as it is, and I'm not making light of this at all, but looking at what Christ did on the cross, which I think is incredible. I'm not in any way demeaning that at all. Um, that uh, we would sit and look at that for eternity and think about it. There's only a, a limit to how long you can go through that scenario before you're going to say, I got it, I'm going to move on. Let's give it a thousand years, I think, you know, 10,000 years. At some point that plays out. It's got to be something else she's talking about. Now, if you move and go and look at what we're talking about here, way to get all of these retro elements out and keep you, you, me, me, not trigger our CAPSA system, that's phenomenal. Because all of these genes are in gene networks. Gene regulatory networks, they're all I involved and you can't just come in and start splicing out even the 98% which used to be called junk DNA and now with the ENCODE project which came out in 2007, 2012, we now know as important regulatory elements. Even if you go and start removing parts of those, the cell can't function because they regulate numerous different protein coding areas. I could go on, I don't want to, I think you're getting where I'm going to, the, the task is impossible. And it would take, in my opinion, the original code writer, which we're told in John chapter one, that through him were, it was everything made, the original guy that came up with the code would need to come in and fix this problem because it is far beyond anyone else's capabilities. Oh, I really have enjoyed what you said, and you've made a good point. You defended it extremely well. Um, I was just going to comment on this gentleman's uh, uh, question. And as it strikes me, uh, that was a classic case of uh, extortion. I mean, he's trying to extort God himself. And it goes from there. Yeah, if you, uh, I was only to able to bring obviously small snippets, and even with that, I ran over. Uh, if you would go and read them for yourself, you'll really get this picture fleshed out. It was uh, read everything. Just start with patriarchs and prophets, but go on to confrontation. Go to signs of the times. Go to the original times when she first printed it, and especially early writings even, she tends to say a lot of things which were edited out in Patriarchs and Prophets in 1888. Yeah. Uh, you want to go to the earlier stuff where she was more uh, specific, and you will see that this was, um, wasn't the, a the devil random doing random acts of violence. He had a specific plan in mind. And there was a reason why that got the evil angels and everyone to go along with him is because they had a chance here to get out of this hole that they, had, they were in and they appeared that there was no other way of escape. Yeah, makes good sense. Uh, any thoughts of uh, why the trees were in the garden to begin with? I'm sorry? Like why any theological or any thought of why the trees uh, were in the garden to begin with to give the temptation? To oh, why the tree was there in the beginning? Okay, I think, tell me if I'm scratching where you're itching, because I think this is what you mean, and correct me if I'm not. Why would God put a tree in the garden who eating the fruit would cause death when he put the pear in the garden to dress it? Why would he put something in that garden which in the end is going to keep them from doing why he made the garden for in the first place? That would put us in a very untenable position because that would make God to be extremely illogical, and then we're all in trouble. So let me now back up and say, why would there be a tree of life? That's the first question. Why do we have to have a tree that we have to keep eating of in order to renew our life? That's the first question. Then we'll get to the tree of knowledge of good and evil in a second. So let's answer that question. Well, the whole thing that we've been told in the Bible and 
through ever, all centuries, the church has been well aware, even the, the um, I think the argument can be made that people in the Old Testament is that what we're dealing with here is a crucial issue of free will. Free will and free choice, because without free will and free choice, we can, ex we can have none of the things that all of us hold dear in this room, which would be love, uh, creativity, the future being different than your past, um, all the things that, that we would, if we were automatons, the joy of life would be gone. So the, everything rests on that. Now, in order to have free will, you have to have a choice, be able to choose between something. If I tell you that um, you can have any car and it's in the next room, you have free choice, you can have any car you want, and you go in the next room and all there is is a bunch of Yugos. <laughs> all right? Is, have I really given you a free choice? Or if I put in there a couple of Mercedes and some uh, Maseratis and some Ferraris, now you've got free choice. But if all I do is I keep you, I say you can pick any, you go on the lot and they're all black and they all are exactly the same, your choice is, it's a farce. So what God has to do is he says that you're in paradise here. But I can't assume that all of you want to stay here. So if I'm really going to offer free choice, and we're not talking whether you want apples or pears or pomegranates, we're talking the very essence of your being. In order for me to be totally, uh, to keep this option totally open for you, here, here's what it is. You have the option to not go on. Now that's the basic option of all. If you don't like the paradise that I've got here for you because you didn't ask to come. You just showed up on the scene. Adam and Eve didn't ask to be uh, created. They just showed up there. So God has to say to them, now look, if you don't like what I've done, I haven't conscripted you to a life of, and I'm putting in quotes, hell. You, you can, there, here's the way out, don't eat of the tree of life. You'll waste away, it'll be a painless death and you'll be gone. Now I think there's other reasons why there had to be a tree of life and I'm mercifully not gonna go into them. I think they're genetic and I think they make all kinds of sense. But just from that reason alone, that would be reason to have, why you're going to have that. And we're told in Isaiah 66 that there will be a tree of life in heaven and every month it has a new group of fruit and that we're gonna come and eat it. And we're talked about in Revelation where the tree has trunks on either side of the tree of life and they're all the fruit is there for the redeemed. And one of the big rewards that Christ gives to those of the churches, the seven churches is you're gonna to get to eat of the tree of life. And the word is, you know, to continue to eat, not just one time. You've got to continue to eat of it. So that is the ultimate. God's not going to get rid of that option. The Bible says there will be no more death in heaven, but it doesn't say that there can't be any death. And there's a big difference there. It says there will be no death there. Okay, that means that we're told no one's going to take God up on the option of not eating the fruit. But the fruit's still there. And the rules still apply. You have to continually eat of this fruit to live forever. So if someone decides that, as, as uns, it, to us in this position and reading what heaven's like, it seems ludicrous. But if someone were to decide, I don't want to keep going, there's a way out. You aren't forced into this existence. Now, to the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it's real simple. If you're going to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, uh, right next to it's a tree of life. Eating of the tree of life affirms that you're going to take on God's, you're, 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 you like the status quo if you're Adam and Eve. You're reaffirming that you are going with the status quo. T tree of knowledge of good and evil says, no, I want a different, I want different than what I have here. If you've ever heard the, the statement, without criticism, there can be no true praise. Think of that for a moment. If you were able to somehow put a filter on all of your friends, your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, that all they could do is give you positive remarks. And all that's all you would hear. But let's suppose for the three positive remarks that they were allowed to say to you, there was a hundred negative ones and you didn't hear them. Within a short period of time, you'd be alone. No one would want to be around you. That would be an absolute worst case scenario. So without what God is doing here is he's saying, okay, I'm going to put next to you, there's, a, there's someone else out there who is able to program environments and, and 
living organisms. And that he has made it clear that he wants a chance to do this. I, now, in order to be fair, if I'm going to honor this free will business, it's got to be presented. You have to have a chance to turn it down. If I don't do it, I quoted Ellen White again. She said God would be viewed as accused of being arbitrary. In other words, you let some people are, uh, uh, exposed to it and not others. Now, what God did was he set up a very simple situation. What he said was, look, biological active ingredients in both of these trees. If you eat of my tree, you are perpetuating the status quo. And I would suggest to you that when you make up your decision, whether you're going to go talk to the other side or not, that you think about this primarily, this should be your decision platform from which all your other decisions come from. And that is, do you like it here? Do you like what I've done? Have I been in any way um, untowards toward you? Or have I done everything for your, uh, for your benefit? I think you've been beat this one to death. Can we move on? Yes. <laughs> Um, the rebellion didn't start in Eden. It was there before. Do you apply your same system to the angels that uh, rebelled against God? I'm thinking mechanistically here. Ellen White says that angels going and coming to the earth today have to present a gold card to get into heaven. Um, I've always been a little bit afraid of that statement. I don't know what to make of that statement either. Um, to, to give a full discourse on what I, how sin originated, which is, I think, what you're asking. How did it come about in the first place? Um, I will give you just the most superficial, precursory overview. And in doing that, I know that I'm going to open up a lot of uh, fertile ground for people to take out of context and to make a lot of things that I normally would uh, make clear, but I can't due to time constraints. Um, Sin is defined, as I did in my second lecture, as addition, the unauthorized addition or subtraction from any of God's laws. And in specific here, with, as it deals with human beings, it would be the genetic uh, component, his code. So any unauthorized deletion or addition. Now, do angels have DNA? I don't know. But one st stipulation that I made on in the science of sin and salvation was that the way we can di differentiate a creator from a created being is that the creator doesn't have an information system, or if he does, it's one we wouldn't recognize. And all of the rest of his, what he has created has an information system that we would recognize as being such. So then now that, now sin as it pertains to us then would be that somehow we or other created en entities have messed with their information system. Do angels have DNA? I have no clue, but we do have some text, Hebrews 2.16, um, uh, Paul says that Christ took himself not the nature of angels but the nature of Abraham. That's not definite proof. There's other ways we can read that. We talked about that earlier about uh, you know reading the same sentence. And then in other areas, um, uh, when you read Ellen White, she talks about um, that the what the devil uh, had done to Adam and Eve, he had first done he had is done the, in essence the same thing to the angels in heaven. Now she doesn't say that Adam and Eve were inoculated with mobile genetic elements, so a person is able to get out of that statement by saying, "Well, you're saying that that's what she means," and I don't think she means that at all. But if if you will give in this discussion that it is mobile genetic elements, then something of that nature that the devil must have done to himself, and it is Ellen White talks about the fact that what started this whole thing in the first place was that the devil was jealous of Christ because Christ was brighter than he was. And in uh, Daniel 12, 3, it talks about the saints will be bright and they will shine as the stars. And Christ refers to it in Matthew, where the uh, redeemed, when they're raised, will be very bright. So there, there is a discussion of that. And from what Ellen White wrote, I am inferring that the clo there, your rank in heaven is really uh, an issue of how bright you are. And I'm guessing here, maybe it's you're able to ref reflect God's glory the best. I don't know. But that is an issue. And the devil was jealous because he felt Christ was getting preferential treatment and that Christ was brighter than he was. So he went around to try to remedy that. Now, she doesn't say he worked on his information system. But she says other things that would be very much compatible with that. So if you started in that realm and that the devil did something to his information system first 
And let's say for argument's sake that uh, he thought he was a little brighter. Now he could go to the angels and he would have a marvelous system to get into them because he would say, look, I have been in the internal meetings with the Most High. I've watched him for millions of years. I have learned how he does his code. And let me tell you something, he has restricted us in the way he has coded for us. We could really do a lot more, but he's purposely kept us stunted so that we don't challenge him. And I now know how to write code, and it's to, for heaven to be better, we should all be like God. We shouldn't have this hierarchy, and if you are going to uh, understand what's going on here, you're going to join me, and you're going to let me uh, re rearrange your genome. Look what, I'm now brighter. I, here's proof. I'm not asking you to do something for which I haven't shown you scientific evidence. I'm brighter. And I did this myself, and I have the capabilities of doing it to you. If you read Ezekiel 28, it talks about him dealing in merchandise. Until the day that he says, you are perfect in all your ways, until iniquity was found in you. When I've gone through the Bible and I see iniquity, I put mobile genetic elements and everything works just perfectly. Um, so, um, you see, but at the, so the end of the day, what does Christ say in, in, Ma in John 8? He goes, you are of your father, the devil. He was the first liar and he was the first murderer and you're just like him. She, he was talking to the Pharisees. Now, when we use father in our human language, what does that mean? That's who you get half your, uh, you got half your DNA from. So, um, does this prove it? But no, it, to me, it strongly suggests it. And if you go through the whole scenario, and I'll throw one other thing out at you. If the devil wanted to get to the tree of life, we don't know that they eat, but I gave you a couple illustrations in the Bible where it suggested that they might. Maybe where he went too far and Christ says, you've gone too far and I can't do anything for you, is maybe the devil did eat of the tree of life after he had done his own Bailey work on himself and on the angels and in an attention and in, a, in an effort to try to bolster their uh, rebellion and they knew a war of a fight was coming they wanted to have everything going possible and she does refer to the fact that they wanted to eat of the tree of or get to the tree of life so that their strength would be enhanced and that's possibly why because if you recall the devil went out and was left the presence as the archangel and went out and disseminated um, agitation in the angel ranks and throughout heaven against God's government and after that Ellen White said that he was still God would take him back and would would have reinstated him then Christ met with him and said you are now at the precipice if you go further I can't do anything for you and, and Ellen White says in ways that only the divine mind could come up with to persuade him he showed the devil and the devil was convinced for a short period of time and then decided it was too embarrassing for him to retract and so he went forward. So um, I'm just giving you a scenario that at that point in time maybe he ate of the tree of life and that's why he is, that's why he wanted Adam and Eve to eat of the tree of life because after they have eaten of the tree of knowledge and the tree of life they'd be in the exact same spot he was in. I don't know that for a fact, I'm just throwing that out there for thought. Okay, I've got a question on, uh, so basically your thesis is that when God created man he created a perfect human genome, and due to transposons or mobile genetic elements, it's been corrupted, and 98% or so is corrupted. I want to approach this from the gene therapy perspective, or similar to the, the genetic engineering. So we are, we're talking in gene therapy restriction enzymes or endonucleases that are actually able to go in and snippet out parts of the genome. Uh, you also mentioned mosaism, the fact that it's different in different cells, and we understand that it's partly due to methylation, uh, that we all have the same, in each one of our cells, each human being has the same exact genome, you know, except maybe the red blood cells and our germline cells, but the others are the same, but the difference is they are methylated and the genes are silent, only coding what is coded. So here's the question. So if transposons are in there, and, and they are the ones obviously causing havoc. I mean, that's, we don't refute, there's no refuting about that. They, those are inserted in the wrong places. They cause havoc, they cause disease, they cause de disease leading to death. And therefore, in sin, you know, sin nature could be the point. But we should be able to, like in the case of gene therapy for the child who had SCID, uh, which is a, se a severe uh, combined immunodeficiency case, where the Dr. Anderson actually went in there and, and did that using adenovirus therapy. Should we not be able to use a similar method? You're not trying to take every transposon out. 
obviously you can because the cells are going into apoptosis and kill the person, but should we not be able to take out at least a part of what could be the worst case scenarios, so therefore giving man an opportunity to be uh, some form of restoration? The answer is no. I've gone down that path. Number one, and I'll show you later, Richard. Richard is a PhD in geneticist, by the way. So he's, uh, he, we know each other. Uh, the, there is uh, some very interesting papers which have come out which say the mosaicism is not in the methylation, it's actually in the code itself. And they give us an example for this. There was a, page, a person who uh, was picked up, a woman was raped in Seattle and she was brought in, she filed a police report and they took uh, uh, a sample from her and then she identified who she thought the rapist was. They went to the rapist and they got a buccal smear and when they looked at the two, he was not he was not the, the one. She says, I know he's the Chimera. one. I know he's the one. So then what happened was they said, well, let's get some of his seminal fluid and check it. And there was a perfect match. The paper then went on to, to go into the fact that because mobile genetic elements now have been able to do so much more than before, that, for instance, in a human, uh, and they actually, I'll give you the paper this afternoon, in, a, in twins, in monozygotic twins, that uh, even at birth, they have enough different mosaicism. This is code, this is not epigenetic. That's parental imprinting, and that's a different story. This is actually, the code is different, because during the rapid uh, neural tube development and when the fetus is growing, there's such great turnover, and it's during turnover that mobile genetic elements have their biggest chance to mutate, that they have done enough mutation by the time the children are born that the, two, that the DNA from both of the twins now is substantially different. And, as they get older, they get further and further because the mobile genetic elements have their own, have a different effect on both of the children. So, and then they go on to say, but it's even worse than that. You can get two liver cells and you can actually get a different code. And now they're bringing, they're bringing they're, the reason they were bringing this article up is they think forensic, forensically that when they go into um, court now, good defense lawyers will be able to show that it depends on which cell you are looking at, depending on what DNA actual code you get. And this is chimerism. Chimerism, yeah, so yeah, I knew yeah. that's what you're talking about. Yeah. But that's the exception. The, we all know that the, the, that is the exception to the rule. The rule is that we are, our cells are similar, and in fact we are 99.9% 90 .9 the same across the races based upon our genome. So my point is, just as gene therapy works, and where you can actually correct some genes, we ought to, I mean, it's theoretical, of course, be able to go in and take out some of those worst case genes that cause us to be awful murderers or awful sinners in one point or the other. Well, yeah, no. Well, but even in the, let me, let me back up uh, one, one, sta one statement that you made. And I was trying to, what, what did you say right before that? Um, you said um, we are the, we have similar. We have a, the exception to the rule. Yeah, but it was right before that. Uh, uh, it'll, I'll have to come back to me because I got too many things going through. Here's the thing: if you if you were able to find, um, and I'll, I'm going to feed right into where you're trying to go, and then tell you why it can't work. There is a family uh, in uh, somewhere in the old Yugoslavia, which they have identified of the 258 or so, give or take, I can't remember the exact number, males, that 80% uh, of them are in prison for murder, all right? And so they wanted to go look at this subset of people and say, we're going to find out what the answer is. Well, what they found was, is that they have a defect, mobile genetic element driven, uh, in their feedback system of the amygdala, when they start getting angry, and in this case it was a dopamine receptor that is, lacks the ability of triggering a negative feedback loop. So when they start getting angry, they start getting angrier and angrier, and there's no negative feedback loop. And for those of you who are acquainted with uh, biological systems, there's, there's negative feedback loops everywhere, or the system wouldn't survive, the organism wouldn't survive, because you'd go off on a tangent. So there, the negative feedback is gone. And they can find, they can see where the defect is, where they think the defect is in the uh, protein coding area for the, ah, and I know where it's gonna go, protein coding area. But the trouble is, for them to go in and try to cut it and remove it, it would uh, destroy the, the protein coding area for the receptor entirely because of the way it's set up. 
So there is no way to go in and do that. Now, where I was going to get back to is, I agree, we're 99.5% the same in protein coding areas. But in the areas between, which are the 98%, we're different. Otherwise, we wouldn't have um, Miami Vice or whatever it is where we can use DNA to differentiate ourselves from each other. So it is true in the protein coding areas, we're 99.5% the same. But in the non-coding areas, which is 98%, we're different. Otherwise, we couldn't use genetics to differentiate one person from another, a parental apprentice. We have 3.2 billion nucleotides. Right. And 0.1% of that is some million odd. So we are looking at short tandem repeats, STRs, that makes us different from each other. That's not the reason. The reason is not what you're saying. The reason is we are looking at only very short tandem repeats, which are like three, or three to six base pairs. That's what forensic science is based upon. Not, not, on, not on that uh, intron region alone, which, you know, which I like to agree, but I, but I have to tell you that's No, that's the fine. Yeah. Uh, but see, but the point still is, there is, there is uh, the, the difference that they're looking for. If you take two, I have a paper where they take 12 individuals, and they take a strip of, D, of RNA, uh, of a non-coding, where our non-coding RNA is um, transcribed from, and they show that there is mar uh, there's differences there, and they're not a half a percent, they're a lot larger. And that's the uh, part of the area that is um, regulatory. The protein coding areas are nothing more than the piano keys, as I've always said. The regulatory areas are the maestro that gets up and plays those keys. Actually, this is a good point because that shows the fact that we do not uh, are related to the chimpanzees or whatever that say that we are 98% the same because you're not looking. So I, I like that. They're only that looking making. at protein coding areas. Yeah, if you I look, totally agree with if that. If you, part. someone looked at a chimpanzee and a they're human being and said, we're going to take everything, we're going to, they are 66% in agreement. Mm -hmm. And that's being generous because they threw in a lot of stuff. Well, they, uh, they made a, a, a provision for that. Well, we know some mutations occurred over the last four million years or six, I forget which they said since we split off, and we're going to put those in too. If you take those out, we're way less. We're less than 50%. Agreed. That's really good. After. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it's a, a fascinating discussion. Uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, your speculation is a bit overwhelming. Uh, on so many things, uh, because you know, you're, 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 uh, it's clear that the Bible says that man was created mortal. Okay, he was designed with only a, therefore only a certain life expectancy. God created put in in the Garden of Eden a mechanism for life to be continued. Um, you know, mobile genetic elements. Why? You know, there, there's there's thousands of ways that decay and death can occur, uh, and your your so much of your thesis is 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 uh, in terms of physicalism is beyond, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think over over emphasizes so much that we miss a lot about the important things you're bringing up in terms of. Our understanding about death and, the, and w its role in the Garden of Eden and, and, and our fall, um, and what what was like before then. Um, so, um, you know, it's it's uh, you know, you, this, this, you 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 spend a lot of time speculating on mobile genetic elements, but that may not have been the mechanism that brought that brings about death and decay. Uh, you can you can think of thousands of others. And so, um, you know, for example, you could, the cosmic ray flux could be uh, much higher now than it used to be, and which, you know, has its uh, effects on all living things on this planet. Uh, it doesn't have to, we don't have to go to the place where, where we're saying that mobile genetic elements were introduced in the Garden of Eden. It could have been something else. And so, uh, you know, I, and, and that kind of speculation, it, it, we lose, we, uh, it takes away from the important things that there's, there's holes in our, our Adventist theology in terms of understanding what the real role of uh, 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 impact of, of how death came into uh, uh, this world. And uh, I, I think that's the, 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 the bigger uh, focus that, you know, that, that's, that's more important to understand because if, if uh, the, the church just doesn't recognize that. Uh, that 
you know, we really they recognize that we really don't have a good understanding of, of how death impacted the scenario or the events in the Garden of Eden. Um, you know, obviously Adam and Eve had to know something about death in order for things to transpire, like as you described. And, and a lot of the things you brought out are very important to, to, to talk about. Uh, but to spend so much time um, assuming that it's all the introduction of these photogenic elements and its impact, uh, you know, uh, that as we see it today, uh, takes away from a more basic uh, discussion that needs to be made. And, uh, and it's very uh, distracting in, in that sense. So I just, uh, you know, I just want to make When you're point. answering that question, could you also put into effect what he first said, that man, man was made mortal from the beginning? When, he, when God was walking with Adam and Eve on the gar in the garden, there was no sin. Wasn't he immortal at the time? Wasn't he? No, well, I don't know. It's what I would say is this. Th th there's two major issues that were brought up here. So let me talk about the last issue first, and then we'll get well, to the issue. Let me just say, no, it's, it's, before you get started, you know, it, it, that's why it, uh, it, it required the tree of life to be eaten to become immortal. Okay. So if he didn't eat of it, you know, he would die, and Ellen White makes that clear. So it's, it's one of recognizing that, yes, man was created mortal. That means there was a mechanism, a process at which they could die, even without sinning. And so that's, that's an important component that has a lot of impl implications. Because, um, uh, for example, in talking about uh, the, the life uh, prior uh, on Earth, that was her death prior to sin, uh, you know, in, in, in the geologic column, as revealed, uh, potentially revealed in the geologic column. It, what it implies is that we haven't talked about is that if you're outside the Garden of Eden, you'll die because you don't have access to the Tree of Life. And so if there's animal life out there, how did they how did they have immortality? They didn't, and so that's there's some implications here that be worth talking about. Well, um, first of all, just uh, remind me of this one because I want to go back to the early one. Um, I have what I say to people who say, "Well, you're using two mobile genetic elements all the time." I say, "Okay, come to the table and put up your evidence, but remember." It's got to be her heritable because Paul says in Romans 5.12 that sin is inherited. Through one man, sin came to everyone. Therefore, it's going to have to be in the DNA by definition because a male sperm is nothing more than a protein coat around 23 chromosomes, a few microRNAs, uh, and a few messenger RNAs, and that's it. There's nothing, there's nothing else in there. What about the antidote then? You say that that needs to be... Well, Done, gone to the families or whatever. What about the antidote? How does that get in? Christ. When Christ came. Okay. okay. But tell me where that's, that's getting into the genome. Okay. I have a whole lecture of two hours. Can yeah. you just tell me this? Well, because if I just tell you without me, showing uh, you the... If I, here's the problem. If just, I give, just give me a... Um, uh, an allegory or something that would that would answer that. You don't have to go through all that stuff. You should be able to do that. That's well, what Christ did that all the time. Here's a simply what it says in Hebrews and a number of areas. And in that talk, I give a lot of biblical text. I do that more than I do science. What it says is that he had to be, um, that Christ was our high priest and that he has been tempted exactly the way we have, that he took on human nature, that he took on sinful nature, not pre-fall nature. She makes it very clear that he took on David. He took on Abraham's nature. Uh, and I don't see the problem is, is you're going to say, where are those texts? Well, for me now to delve in and give you the text, that's why I'm trying to defer to this, because I go through the Bible and I start with this first. So I will give you a, a brief overview, but you're not going to like it because I haven't pre pre presented the text that I say support it. But at the end of the day, he came, he took our, evil, our nature on him. Half of his chromosomes came from heaven, half came from Mary. Otherwise, why would he call him his mother? Our definition of a mother is someone that gives half of the chromosomes. We, we, we delineate a surrogate from a real mother very carefully, and legally, we do the same. So we make the real mother in the court as the one who gives the DNA, and that's why in the surrogate mother cases, they always go to the one who originally gave the DNA as being the real mother and trying to de determine if the surrogate mother doesn't want to keep the, wants so, to keep so the child. So sin comes in through the machine. So he's got sure. to... So, so the problem is you've got to 
you need a bit you have a bad oil in your crankcase you need to change it but it's you're, you're making it sound so simple it's not well, i want oil. it to have it simple it's, so it's, i can understand yeah, it no it's every the end whether we like it or not our dna is going to code for who we are i told you earlier that our hawks genes uh, now they feel that they uh, have a zip code, if you will, for every one of the cells in your body, where they are and what they're supposed to do. That's all programmed out and it's there. Well, that, what's the point you, of that? I'm trying to understand. The point is, if you get in there and you mess with that, you've got a problem. Okay, if you can mess with that, but, but you're talking about the machine again. But the machine is, you can't have any thought or anything else like that if the machine's not functioning. If I look at all that's, of these... That's, that's speculation. That, that's pure physicalism. Look at trisomy There's 20, no spiritual component wait, in that. look at trisomy 21. Look at trisomy 21 where you've got three 21 chromosomes and the more of that 21st chromosome you have, the more cognitive impairment to the point where the person cannot even consider Then you have no fru real free choice then because it's all chemically that driven. That person doesn't have free choice and Ellen White makes the statement that those type of people will be as if they never were. You have, if, if, uh, uh, if you've got, you have to have, your brain is coded for by that DNA whether you like it or not, and your brain is the seat where all of your thinking goes on, like it or not, and so the basic hardware that you have, like in a computer, if you don't have the basic hardware there, all of the other things that you're talking about the computer does are immaterial. You've got to have the hardware. Well, I'm, you said to give you an, an analogy, and that's the closest one we have to a mind. How would I make an analogy to a mind that's almost impossible to make an analogy to? Because we don't have anything like it. Consciousness. consciousness is a whole new issue. But I will tell you this, if I can take and I can make you lose consciousness by injecting something in your brain, then uh, in your vein, not brain, it goes in your vein to your head, then therefore your consciousness is predicated on something that's physical because I gave, introduced something physical into your body and it altered your consciousness. It's called anesthesia. It's called anesthesia. So therefore consciousness is predicated, that to me is, we're done with that discussion, a consciousness is predicated on physical events. Well, look, we're talking about angels. We, that's where speculation does get out of control because we're not given any, a lot of information. I'm not going to angels. I'm, gonna, I'm, staying, I'm staying with human beings because that's what I made the talks to begin with, and that's where I'm staying. Hello. Evidence and consciousness exists within the spirit as well as within the body. Where do you have a biblical backup for what you said? Excuse me, can I have a question? Yeah. Please. Um, I just want to know, uh, going back to your earlier comment, and here I may be the only person supporting that, um, chimpanzees, the evolutionists claim chimpanzees are 99 point so much percentage similar to 98. humans. 98. They say there's 98. only 2% difference. Right. Thank you. Um, and you're saying that's not including the non-coding portion of the genome. But even if you include the non-coding and I don't think the difference is that much because why would FDA rely on animal testing to approve almost all our drugs if it fails there there's no further testing no you have to you're wrong pass the because animal the test. protein coding areas are what make the enzymes and the enzymes are what we make drugs for we make drugs for protein coding uh, receptors that's where most of the drugs if you go look up most of the drugs we have today are for protein coding receptors that's a protein coding area and that is where we are the same as they are there is none of the areas which are regulatory that we make drugs for it's all protein coding areas and I can that one's easy to prove that one's not hard to prove and then back to Dr. R's question were we made mortal or were we made immortal and Genesis. okay uh, one other comment on the physicality of things uh, when I look at the genome, the only thing that I can find anywhere in it is mobile genetic elements. And when I find those, they answer all of the things that the Bible says is sin. So that's why I go on mobile genetic elements. If you can find something else in the genome, which would e even show part of what the Bible said is sin, bring it to the table. I would like to see it. I, for 10 years, I've gone over the genome, and I've, gone over ten, I've got 10,000 papers that I've looked at that I have personally. 
and I can find nothing but them. It's not because I chose them, it's because they're the only, they're only game in town. Now, back to how were we created? Well, if we were, we were also created uh, that uh, we have no evidence that Adam and Eve could have lived if they hadn't eaten, do we? And there's lots of fruit in the garden, and we, st we need to eat now to live. If, if uh, I don't think that's a, a high supposition to guess that Adam and Eve had to eat too. They could have starved themselves. Well, they were given fruits and nuts. Right, and, and nuts, and then for, said, for this food. is what you're going to use for food. So, so in that sense, Before he's right. Sin. You could do things in the garden which would cause your death. Don't eat, or, or eat. eat, but don't eat of the tree of life and you'll just fade away. So, th th but does that mean that they had bad, uh, by I use the word, that they had, in, uh, that they had um, metabolic systems which had been in some ways changed? No, their metabolic systems worked perfectly. There was a paper that I talked about in the lecture three where we looked at the fact that there is programmed um, inefficiency in all of the enzymatic uh, functions of the body. It's programmed in, and the author goes on to say that this programmed inefficiency is what causes an increase of ROS, which is rock, uh, reactive oxygen species. And all of these uh, uh, um, buildup of either not fully utilized um, uh, stuff that, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, reagent, stuff that you're gonna work on versus uh, a substrate versus a product. That some of the, all, not all the substrate is used and it sticks around and gets into other metabolic pathways where it makes products which are lethal to the cell. And on this side, products that are made are imperfect and they don't do everything they're supposed to do and so the function of the cell is compromised and if for that reason alone the cell would die because these inefficiencies that are programmed into the cell uh, will result in the cell dying and they used as their example beta amyloid with Alzheimer's disease as being an exa perfect example of that. And it's endemic in the system. And he says, unless you could get into the system and completely re-engineer it, then you could live forever. Okay, I'm saying in the Garden of Eden, they didn't have that restriction. That was not there. All of the systems worked perfectly. Everything was engineered in a, in a, what does God say at the end of uh, first chapter of Genesis? Everything is very good. Everything works in synergy, and not only just with human beings, but everything around it. Was, was everything in, in place? We're now talking a new instance where everything around Adam and Eve, as well as Adam and Eve themselves, that all of their metabolic systems are, to some degree or another, deranged. Now that's a new, that's a new, that's a horse of a different color. Yes, if Adam and Eve don't eat, they're gonna die, and if they don't eat of the tree of life, they're going to die, but they're going to die, be, they, they have now seeds within them that are going to speed along this process. So when God said, the day that you eat of the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil, dying you will die, he was obviously, uh, 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 refer, um, he was obviously uh, take, took into account that Adam knew that you had to eat of the tree of life to live forever. Because, for instance, if I'm running a diving ship and I come up to you and I say, don't stay too long down there, you might die, we both know that I'm referring to the fact that you've got only a limited amount of oxygen and if you go past that, you're going to die. I don't have to delineate that. So when Christ, Christ said to Adam, you know, you have to eat of this tree to live and if you eat of this one, you're gonna die, it should have been fairly intuitive that, to him to say, well, that means I can't eat of this tree then, doesn't it? So I don't think God was being disingenuous there. I think that this was, a, um, to, was clear to all parties involved at the time. So you would, what is happening is, is Adam it has to have a perfectly working system and he needs access to the tree of life. And there's a lot of things that the tree of life might do, but it'd be all conjecture and I don't want to go into that. But you need both of those to get where you want to go. And we have neither of those now. Um, <clears throat> okay, I, th I think the discussion over here about salvation is missing something very important. Um, now, I I don't, I don't know about all these things you're telling. It sounds interesting and maybe right. And if, if, certainly we do have a lot of mutations in us. I mean, I think we could all agree on that. 
and Jesus will have to fix that. Okay, but let's say that, that indeed you are right, and all these things is what causes us is involved in sin. Well, salvation, what, okay, when Jesus has to fix that at, at the end, but that's not salvation. Salvation is a spiritual, spiritual process that we accept the salvation that Jesus offers. And all, what that does is it gives Jesus permission to indeed fix all those mechanical problems at, at, when he resurrects us. So that doesn't, it isn't those one or the other, mechanical or salvation, they're both involved. And, and salvation is indeed a spiritual problem, uh, process, n not a mechanical process. Well, I think that salvation is in fact giving Christ, uh, God, the chance to come in and work on your system. And, and I spend a lot of time on that. But the point is this. There are some very neat uh, uh, articles out which show that, for instance, selfish behavior is um, enhanced if you have certain mutations in the um, oxytocin promoter. And they've done it over in Israel, and they've taken um, 200, 100 males, 100 females, and they did what is called the dictator game. And what they did in the dictator game is they put each one of them into a room, and they had a computer in it, and they said, okay, if you want, uh, the way this works is, this experiment works, is there's another person in another room in this building that you will never know, that they will never know who you are, you will never know who they are, they're going to go out through a different exit. And you, here's $100 bills that we're putting on, and you are capable of keeping all 100 if you want, or you can share as much as you want with them, but you're the dictator. And so what they asked them to do was, the uh, only thing they had to do was get on the computer and type in what they were going to give you know, to the uh, unlucky recipient on the other end if they were selfish. And to kind of summarize the whole thing, uh, what they found is that there was three areas, uh, three SMPs, where if the people had that SMP, the, uh, the idea to act um, selfishly, which was defined as keeping $51 or more for yourself, that the, it was a, a correlative with that, I forget if it was 68 or 75 percent, somewhere in that region. And conversely, if you didn't have any of the three, it was a flipped coin. You had about a 68 or 69 percent chance that you were going to be altruistic. Well, they thought, oh, let's go ahead and let's retest it. So they did a, another test, uh, another scheme where they did, uh, it again looked at altruism versus selfish behavior. And they came out with the same result. And all of them, all the candidates, obviously, all the uh, research participants had their buckle smear. So I noticed it didn't cause them to be selfish, but it seemed to predispose them because 25% of the, of the people who had all three mutations out of the 15 they looked at, which were found to correlate with one way or the other, were altruistic. And flip side of the, the um, two-thirds, uh, I mean the people who had none of them, a th almost a third of them were selfish. So there's other things that go beyond this, but it sets the tone is what I'm arguing, it, and what I'm putting forth. It sets the basis from which other decisions now are going to be made. It's the platform that you're given to start with. It doesn't mean you can't work around it. It can't mean you can't work with God to get this thing taken care of. But it does introduce into the system this bias. That, and by the way, those SMPs were clearly out implicated in an ALU, which is right next door to that promoter, as being the cause of those uh, mutations. Now I know, I, I'm well aware that everyone says, why do you talk about mobile genetics all the time? Why, 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 why? But if you look at the genetic literature as I have, it's the only game in town. There's not another fiddle I can pick up and play. There's not another, uh, another group of something I can bring out to you and say, ah, but it could be this, let's look at this. This is it. And when you go through the Bible, and go through what it delineates as sin, and then you go into science, you will find that there's plenty of literature that will step to the table and support everything that you're talking about. And, it, and they, those scientists, which have no dog in the hunt, tell you it's mobile genetic elements. So have, for me, after looking at this evidence, um, maybe I've become blinded by it. That could be. But in order to get me off of this rut, you need to present something else that's heritable that it can be inherited, that we could do it, and I will happily look at it. 
Um, some time ago, long time ago now, I read the book by Dawkins, and it was entitled The Selfish Gene. Yeah. And the thing that struck me after having gone through the whole book was this, the, 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 the uneasy feeling that we're looking at a small part of a much larger picture. And that Dawkins was explaining everything in terms of DNA. In fact, he coined the phrase, DNA works in mysterious ways. Now, I, I think he, he took that from a different expression, did he not? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Okay. And the, the reason why it bothered me, what he was saying, is because it limited the entire concept to one level of discussion. Information is not limited to one particular level. Information exists at every level. And at every level, you have to have the correct information. Whether you're talking about subatomic particles, whether you're talking about uh, atoms uh, putting together molecules, whether you're talking about molecules putting together structures uh, and cells putting together tissues, etc., etc. At every level, you have to have the correct information. Correct information on one level does not solve falsehood at another level. So what I see in, in the original fall, which you discussed here today, and I liked what you talk about, the mobile genetic elements, but I would like to suggest that when you're considering the three different alternatives, that it is quite possible that it's not an either or. It may be A and B and C. Do you know what I'm saying here? Yeah. Here, let so me that we're not, we're no longer talking about a problem that is limited to one uh, scale or one particular level. The problem is multifaceted. Uh, the problem is almost pervasive in a nested sense, so that there is nothing that is left without it. Okay. And so the solution also has to incorporate elements of, of, of how should I say, antidote on every level. I agree that it's multi-level, no doubt about it, and that because God just creates, changes the code, let's say he puts it back, that there is other things that are going to ha happen above it. If you look at the way genes are set up, there is a general basic gene regulatory network. And then you start, and I'm simplifying here for, uh, for illustrative purposes, then you start building multiple ones that start going up and up, and they have over here and over here and over here and over here. And they build up, and it, and it builds like this. It has to have a fulcrum. And that's what geneticists are looking for, is the fulcrum and the different genetic gene regulatory networks. There is one fulcrum from which all of the other networks are based. And it gets more complex as you go higher. So if I can use this as an example, until you've taken care of this, before you're going to start working up here. It does you no good until you've taken care of this. All of these come into play. And you can, in turn, have a big influence on all of these. Yes, they need further correction. But without correcting this, you're not going to get anywhere. So from my perspective. But, but, but the rejoinder to that is we cannot use our genetic state as an excuse for the sin we commit. 
Otherwise, there would be no point for God to give us the Ten Commandments. If, if we're somehow doomed because of our genetic makeup, look, I got faulty genes. You know, in fact, I, I remember reading a cartoon by Calvin and Hobbes uh, where Calvin did something and, and, and uh, the mother asked, now, what made you do that? And he looks up and says, faulty genes? Do you think mother was amused? <laughs> so the, you know, the old statement that you could have used you know, this one the devil made me do it you know, yeah. well you know and, and, and as you know in the Bible it actually says let no one say the devil tempted me to do this or that, that that's not or, or, or okay. that God tempted me you no, know, it's, it's you. It's God. The, the, the well, Bible that, that's one verse. That there is another one where you're talking it, about David. It talks about well, there is yeah. another place I believe in Revelation where it's, where it talks. Well, I have to dig up the verse. Okay, uh, where it talks about let nobody uh, excuse themselves on account of the devil, because he will pay for his sins. But each one of us has our responsibility too for the choices we make. Each day we make choices. We cannot have it both ways. No, you don't. You know, now, we cannot me, have the choice and then say, well, uh, you know, genetic elements uh, made us do what, the wrong when, choice. Where you're, where you, where, what you're not taking in consideration in this discussion is the Holy Spirit. Without God coming in and entering the system, and he did it from the get-go in Genesis 3.15, he says, I'm going to put enmity between your seed and her seed, which the seed is the Hebrew word is zira, and that it, it means it's close as we're going to come to genetic components. Uh, there's six other words they, they could have used if you wanted to use descendants. This is the one that can be used for descendants, but it primarily means her heredity. So he stepped into the system. Without him stepping into the system, and Ellen White makes that statement, we would have been toast a long time ago. So you, there is someone that's stepping into the system in a major way. So you're saying we've got to have a genetic change before we can have a relationship with God? No, I'm saying that you come to God in the way that you are and that you say that we need to work together. And this is a, pr a process where we not just, it's not uh, an automaton like just sit here and fix my genetics. If you look at the way the brain circuitry work, that what it has to do is you have to center your thoughts and make them align up with God. And I will use Philippians 4.12, which says that you are to think on these things. And Christ in, in, in Matthew 15 said that it's out of the mind that wickedness generates. But where does thoughts originate from? Thoughts originate from neurons. How do we know that? We can go in there. Uh, when neuroscientists have for long, neurosurgeons have gone in there. And what they do is uh, when they're trying to ablate seizures, seizure foci, the patient has to be awake. So what we do is we put them asleep, they open up the skull, and we wake the patient up. And what they try to do is they try to uh, engender a seizure by putting the, an electrical probe on different parts of whichever part of the cortex they're looking for. And in that process, you may not get a seizure, but you may get the person saying, I had a memory pop in my head. And they can describe it. One lady, um, they have it on film, described the fact that she remembered being in her mother's house. It was, she was four years old. She described everything her mother was wearing. She smelled the bacon in the pan. She, spelled, she knew what day it was at Tuesday. And so um, the point is, is that whether we like it or not, that, that memory was encoded in those neurons because they touched it with a little, little electricity and all of this came flowing out. You could have touched it in the interface. It doesn't matter. It's still a mechanical, no, it's a mechanical event that prompted the thought. You know what an interface is? You know what an interface is. I know you know what an interface is. The when, you, when you go on the border like that, you, can, you, can, you don't know which side of the border the, the information is coming from. Well, all I know is that this patient, what this patient remembered was if, if you're trying to look at where it gendered from, this was a, a rather innocuous memory from their past that randomly was brought to bear by putting some electrical current. To me, the most simple answer to that is that memory is stored with that. They hit an anchor neuron, it's because we know anchor neurons are how we remember, and that it flipped the circuit. And that anchor neuron had to get there somehow, and the only way that anchor neuron got there was through the DNA that it got from their parents. 
There's no other way you're going to get an anchor neuron unless you have it coded to do so. And that's why I'm saying you've got to work on the code. To work up here, unless you've changed the, the circuitry, to work up here is cosmetic. You've still got the problem endemic. Yes, yes, but you see, the reason why, why we're still here is because we still have some choices to make. If all the choices had already been removed, there would be no reason for us to be here. Who said, I'm, I'm saying that the, let me make something clear. If I have any way along this line have been implying that as you move along to being sanctified, your choices disappear. I w that's not the point at all. In fact, I'm going to argue that in a human being in a state where they, God has not been invited in to work on them has very few choices. I would use as a, as a, as a somewhat of a hyperbolic, I mean a hyper, um, an exaggerated uh, uh, illustration, the two um, dem demoniacs at Gennaroset. They, Ellen White said, they came cursing and yelling and as if they were going to kill him and everyone ran away and Christ was the only one left there. And what he did is he cast the devils out and the devil said, can we go in the swine? He said, yes, you can go in the swine and they, the swine ran over the cliff. Ellen White said that even though everything that was coming out of their mouth was absolutely trash talk against Christ, that Christ was able to look in and see that they really wanted help that they had gotten to the point where they were down to, let's say, their last couple of uh, capable neurons to respond for help. They couldn't even talk about it, say it anymore. And Christ saw that and said, okay, we're taking care of it. That to me is a, is a, uh, a, a somewhat exaggerated situation, but we're all in it. And what, what, what does Christ say in John 6? You will know the truth, I mean in John 8. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What he's talking about is now I'm going to start removing the blocks that you have to making decisions so you can now make more, not less. That is the salvation process to where you get at the end, you now have no blocks on your decision making process. And, and I'm, if, and I, uh, when, you, when you talk about the brain and how it works, you've got to look at the two, the circuitry that you've got there, and it's, it's inescapable that the brain has played havoc with the nervous system. So in order for you to be able to get those choices, you're going to have to get circuits that work correctly. And even a guy by the name of Gerald Crabtree, who's a uh, professor at uh, Stanford, and I showed his article, states that he thinks that human, human's intelligence has been decreasing over the last two to 6,000 years, and the abilities to make choices have gone down, and our, in, and our propensity toward being um, addicted has gone up, and for the exact reason is that the whole, the whole premise of his article was mobile genetic elements were the cause. He's got no dog in this hunt. He, he, he's a clear evolutionist that states so, and makes no problem because then the second paper goes into how he can explain evolutionary why this happens and his answer is because we have a society now that doesn't that that uh, shields us from our uh, decisions and therefore the environment cannot select in other words we we let stupid people multiply and they are not held out there having to get their own food we get it for them and so they that's that was his premise it is uh, now one o'clock and uh, I think this makes a convenient time to break. I'm sure that we could keep going for another several hours if we wanted to, but uh, uh, we'll hold it. Perhaps uh, another time we can uh, uh, have some more discussion, maybe have somebody present from the other side, uh, but uh, or from one of the other sides, because uh, there are obviously multiple sides to this question. Um, and. Uh, so with that, uh, I think we'll uh, call it a day. And thank you very much for uh, presenting. <laughs>